we're talking about dev funding, and we're talking about different ways to fund decentralized systems. Crypto has uh, given us lots of examples of competing funding systems, so we're going to discuss all of that in a second, and I'm going to be chatting with Chris Pacia. Chris is one of my favorite people in the world. He is lead developer of Open Bazaar. He runs BCHD, uh, Bitcoin Cash developer. Can you please give Chris Pacia a very warm welcome to the stage? Just as a sort of preface to our discussion, I wanted to just go through and list some of the different types and then we'll discuss them. And I wanted to end up by talking about the BCH proposal that's just been put forward. Has anyone been keeping up with the BCH proposal? They're thinking of, yeah. So it's like, is this big thing in the crypto community and everyone seems to be talking about it and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But to start off with, I mean, you've got things like Dash, which earmarks funds and those are sort of allocated uh, to the dev space, and then you've got Zcash, they have a founder's reward. Uh, you've got Bitcoin, which has a, really it's like the, um, the normal open source method where you have different companies funding it, they use their own developers, so Blockstream obviously is well known as funding core devs. You've also got Square entering the space, we'll be funding some. That competition adds uh, a nice dynamic in the open source community, and we're really just starting to see that in, in crypto. Bitcoin Cash, it was largely voluntary and now they're thinking of, uh, of having this mining uh, fee that is going to be taken and, and applied to the devs. So Chris, let's start off by talking about some of the pros and cons of these and then we'll discuss the BCH proposal in detail. I think just in general, the problem statement is we have <clears throat> open source software is not your typical software that you would build and, and sell or have some way of monetizing it. Sometimes you can find ways of monetizing open source software, but for the most part, it kind of, a lot of it really fits the, the category of like a, a public good in the economic sense. Um, it's something that's like non-rival risk, non-excludable, and for mo much of this software, <clears throat> people donate their free time to work on. It's kind of a volunteer type thing. And for some applications that aren't that big, um, that's, that model is probably sufficient, just a little bit of, of uh, voluntary work here or there to just keep the code base up to date and running um, is probably fine. But when you start getting into much larger code bases, um, you start needing that type of model where you have contributors come in and work on it for a couple months or submit a patch here or there. Doesn't really work when you have a very, very, very big code base that has a lot of needs on it. And so you kind of need um, to start looking into how can we get funding for developers to work on this full time. And the, the primary model when software open source projects become important enough um, is you start seeing a lot of the businesses that rely on it uh, kind of contribute back a little bit uh, by you know, maybe putting one of their developers on working on the, product or the software full time or something like this. I think in Linux, it's something like 86% of the commits are funded by businesses, um, you know, and it's only like 14% are people just sort of voluntarily working on it. So you have that kind of model where businesses start contributing back when they realize that, hey, this is something that we need for our business, and so it makes sense for us to maybe put like one full-time person working on this or two or three. Um, and maybe it's good to talk about the dynamics of why businesses want to contribute because you'd presume there'd be this free rider um, uh, norm where people be like, oh, well, Microsoft's already funding this. We'll just let them pay for it and it's fine. But the thing is, that means that Microsoft would be changing the code to make it good for Microsoft and it may exclude other businesses. So in order to ensure that it's a great playing field and the tech is still usable by companies, they're incentivized to want to put a dev forward to make sure that it's not being uh, targeted towards any particular company. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's, um, I mean the free rider problem might still be there, but if you're talking, if you're a big company and you have like a billion dollars in revenue, putting one developer working on, on a open source project is like a drop in the bucket. So I, I, think, I, I think in that sense, they just say, oh, we'll do it anyway because the cost is very little. If it, the costs were a lot higher, um, I think it could, it could start, uh, you could start seeing the free ride problem 
uh, build up quite a bit. Right, and then when you change industries, so using the Microsoft example, we are talking about a drop in the bucket, and then you transfer that over to crypto, and we've got you know small profit margins, if any, at the moment with a lot of businesses. So it does become a large expenditure to have someone say, well, we'll just hire a full-time dev that's not working on our project, but working on you know the core code base. Yeah, it's um, the only one that we kind of see, the only coin that kind of is operating on this model right now is Bitcoin because it's become large enough to the point where you're starting to see other um, people uh, or businesses starting to throw money at it. I think Bitcoin gets funding for development. I, there's a number of sources. Um, I know MIT um, pays for a couple developers, I think, or at least... They used to, I have to apologize for not being completely up to date on Bitcoin funding, but I know they used to, probably still do, um, pay for a couple developers to work full time on Bitcoin. Um, there's a company called Blockstream, which um, raised a lot of uh, venture capital and they contribute a couple developers back to working on the protocol um, or, or on the, the open source software. Um, that's, you know, I mean, when you have companies like that, you don't know how sustainable that is. It's a startup company. It's it's Blockstream might not be around forever. Uh, who knows if their products are going to be profitable? So that type of relying on sort of startup companies to finance this sort of altruistically is maybe long term not the uh, um, sustainable source of funding. I also think um, it's a Square is uh, mm -hmm. throwing some money, and that's Jack Dorsey's company is throwing some money at. Um, at Bitcoin development, and then I know like Al Alex Marco started up that that group too. I think he finances some development out of pocket too. So they have, and there might be others that I'm missing. Um, so they have some groups that are willing to step up and kind of finance Bitcoin development. I think because it's sort of the largest one, um, but it drops off very quickly after that. The rest of them, um, you know, don't have that same luxury. Um, I don't know, the Ethereum, I, you know, they, I believe, took like a huge chunk of the initial allocation of coins, right? And I don't know if that's the entirety, uh, I should have looked this up before. <laughs> I don't know if that's the entirety of where they get their money from, but uh, Ethereum does have a, like a fairly large team, but at the same time, they had the, you know, all of those initial tokens allocated to them and then the price just skyrocketed. So. Yeah they're kind of sitting on a lot of money. For sure, and I think like when we're talking about the pros and cons of these systems, uh, when if you do just have a single company funding something, then you can kind of get a project co-opted by that. So it is good that now we're starting to see multiple people in the space putting money towards devs. It wasn't always like that. It was very voluntary and just like maybe one or two. Yeah, that was one of the criticisms of Blockstream because early on they were kind of like the only ones funding core development. In fact, like it was something like most of the core developers were paid by Blockstream and Blockstream was accused of kind of engaging in a form of cronyism of like create the problem, sell the solution, right? You know, kind of choke off the ability to make transactions on chain and then pitch a Blockstream product where they take transaction fees as the alternative. Um, so that that type of capture, if you will, by by businesses, um, you know, is kind of a real threat. And and so, like you said, having kind of a competitive market there, where more than one business is contributing to this sort of thing, I think is can be pretty healthy. For sure. Let's talk a little bit about Zcash briefly, and and maybe compare it to something like Dash. Um, so Zcash has a founders reward. And I believe that they vote every few years on how this money is allocated. And for the past few years, it's been certain people who are intrinsically involved in setting up Zcash. And this gets a lot of flack. Like, when we're talking about these solutions, you have to realize that there are pros and cons to every solution. It's, it isn't just like, well, this is the best one. Let's adopt this. This is 100% correct. There are good and bad things to all of this. Well, I, I think there's concern that just like, if you just give like funds to one group, you worry about it just being like a slush fund and, and what type of oversight is there over on that. I know in Zcash, they, they were initially gonna be like, we're just gonna have initial allocation that, that the new coins that are generated every block, percentage of that's gonna go to the developers, but only for a limited period of time. And then after that, that 
the founders or reward or whatever it was called developer mm -hmm. fund is going to go away and we got to the zcash got to that point and then it's it wasn't sustainable on its own so it was like okay well maybe we should extend it you would like it to get to a point where you don't have to rely on any kind of like protocol funding of developers it's from like a purist standpoint it's a lot nicer if the protocol just you know funds the miners that's that's it um, but if you're coin, you're kind of banking on the coin growing to a point where you get to like Bitcoin level, where you have companies voluntary, uh, voluntarily contributing to development, and if that doesn't happen, then you're in the the area where you're talking about maybe extending it or doing more rounds of financing and that sort of stuff. They've just made decisions, and they're they're almost at the end of finalizing how that's going to happen next. It's been an interesting process to watch all the discussions with that, because again, people are talking about the pros and cons of giving money to different groups, and so I'm I'm very interested when that's all finalized to look into that and see what they've come up with because I know Bitcoin Cash is going through a similar thing at the moment. They're trying to figure out how do we make this sustainable? How do we support developers? And then Dash has a, a slightly, they're all kind of nuanced, they're all slightly different. They, they earmark funds. So explain a little bit about how that works. Yeah, Dash has, um, I think a percentage of their block reward goes into a, like a fund and they have these master nodes um, where people can basically spend a lot of Dash and acquire one of these master nodes and it kind of gives you like a voting stake in the network and then they vote on how to distribute those funds basically. So if like you have developers say, you know, I'd like to work on the protocol, they make a proposal, put it forward, then people vote to give them a percentage of that fund. Right. So let's move on to Bitcoin Cash because I think there's a lot to delve into there with the recent proposal. Um, and right off the bat, I would say that there's a lot of presumptions that the current system is the best system because it's all voluntary, people of their own volition are providing money to devs. And um, as someone who used to work in the non-profit space, I would have to reiterate there are pros and cons to everything. When you work in the non-profit non space, your business model becomes about appeasing donors and about making sure that they're happy and perhaps changing your business model to make sure that they're happy. And that's, I mean, that's definitely something that I think crypto space needs to be aware of, that this not only is the uh, voluntary model, it requires a lot of work. You need an entire team dedicated just towards soliciting donations. Otherwise, you're just relying on people's goodwill and that's not always a good thing to rely on. Uh, but it's just interesting that there has been like these two very divided camps of like, 100% voluntary, let's just make it charity-based, and the other people are saying no, because charity-based is actually a, an active choice you're making. You're creating a business model where you will need a dev team, and in the charity terms, a development team means people who go after donations. So it is a diversion of resources and attention, and a lot of these you know, people don't have that bandwidth to say, all right, we'll just hire three more people, and they'll be our, our development officers who go and solicit donations. So let's talk about the proposal and, uh, and the, the criticisms people have, because there are some legitimate criticisms people have brought up about it. Yeah, so um, a couple of miners, um, Chinese miners, um, they came out with a proposal, basically said, here's what we're, we would like to do is um, basically take 12.5% of the block reward and give it to finance development. And, you know, if, if they just said, well, we're going to take 12.5% of our reward and finance development, I think there would be no problem. Um, but the, the scheme they came up with is they, they basically said we think we have a majority of the mining power and so what they said is we also want to, we're going to reject blocks that don't, from other miners that don't also pay 12.5% of the mining reward to developers. And that's, so it, it, essentially that's a 51% attack, right, is, is your, um, you're basically saying the block has to have this format or a soft fork. It's a, just a, another term for it. But uh, you're basically saying we're going to reject blocks that don't conform to these, this particular set of rules. And it's a little bit disconcerting, I mean, just from like a centralization perspective that just a couple guys can get together and say, here's what we plan on doing and there's not a whole lot anyone can do to stop us because we've got most of the mining power. Um, and I, I know there's a, there's a tendency to say like, well, that's only because like Bitcoin Cash is very small relative to Bitcoin. 
And so Bitcoin cash mining power is just, you know, you could have like one or two pools can have a huge amount of the mining power on Bitcoin cash. But I mean, in reality, it's only a handful of pools on Bitcoin could get together and do the same thing as well. What, like five or six um, could get together and, and basically say, hey, we're doing this on Bitcoin too. And so it's a little disconcerting from that perspective, just the, the power that the miners have. I mean, up to this point, miners have kind of been behaving a bit altruistically and there hasn't really been sort of like a hostile environment where miners are trying to use their power, you know, to do things um, like this, for example. Um, there has been a little bit of a movement. This is one thing I kind of wanted to work on myself and then some of the Bitcoin core people kind of took the lead on it. So, so they just, um, uh, the, but the, what they're doing is they're trying to work on a new mining pool algorithm that would make it so that the mining pools have a lot less power and that the individual miners who control the, the hardware, the ASICs, um, essentially run their own nodes and have more power. And in that type of environment, I think it would be harder to do something like where these miners just get to these, basically they're pool operators, they also control some hardware themselves. But it would be harder for them to get together and say, hey, we're just gonna reject blocks that don't conform to this particular standard. And um, but that's that we're probably, I don't know, a few years out from that and it's not even clear whether the mining sector would even adopt something like that too because it would rely on like voluntary adoption. But putting that aside, where we are today is we have like three miners got together and said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna do this or we wanna do this. And it got a lot of negative feedback from the community. I mean, part of it is people just don't like the notion of sort of changing the protocol in this way. Um, I should point out it was only going to be for six months, like they're going to do it for six months and that's it. Um, and then the other part um, was that the funds were, at least the initial proposal was like the funds would go to some group in Hong Kong and then they would distribute it to the developers and then people were like, well that sounds really unaccountable, we don't know who these people are. So then they kind of came back and said, well maybe we'll just pay directly to the addresses of the developers themselves. Um, and at, people viewed that as slightly better, but they're still kind of opposed to it. Um, and so I'd say kind of where it is right now, it's like up in the air. Um, the proposal, I don't, I, you know, I can't say one way or the other whether it's gonna happen or not happen, but it seemed like the overwhelming majority of the community seemed to be against it um, going through. I should also point out that there was a kind of a clever aspect of this in that after the difficulty adjusts, the people who would actually be paying this money, it was gonna be like $6 million. The people who would actually pay the $6 million would be mostly the Bitcoin core miners because the difficulty would adjust and it would reduce the profitability of mainly the Bitcoin core miners by $6 million. So it was kind of a way of pushing the cost off onto other people to, a, to <laughs> an extent um, and making the other people pay the $6 million, which was kind of clever in that sense. But the downside is that BCH would have 12.5% less hashing power at the, at the end of the day. So people could say, well, that would make the network more secure. But when you look at, B or less secure, uh, when you look at BCH hashing power compared to Bitcoin, a 12.5% drop is still like a drop in the bucket compared to where it is of the overall SHA-256 hash rate. So it's a little unclear how less secure the network would really be at that point. But um, right. yeah, that's a and I think it's interesting that people are talking about this in terms of we shouldn't give miners this much power and people aren't realizing well the miners have this much power they could go ahead and do this there is a chance that they will go ahead and do this whether they have community support or not so recognizing uh, the different attack vectors in the crypto systems is really important so that we can understand how to deal with them and I think dealing with them is mainly a cultural thing to be honest like I mean it, you can kind of um, it's a similar argument with constitutions America people say hold up the the constitution as this bastion of freedom and say it's because of this that America is free and it's not like you look at the Constitution of Russia and it's basically exactly the same what's different is the people who decide whether or not we're gonna hold this up as the paradigm of what we have to follow or not it's very much a cultural thing so perhaps we're at a point now where we need to make a decision as a community and say well is this a culture that we're gonna support is this something that we want in our community and so I think that's why there's been such a, a big backlash against it because it's not whether or 
or not we will give the miners this power. It's whether or not we are going to support a culture where this is permissible or whether, you know, we're going to fight against it and just make it so that it's... I mean, I, I don't know how strong that's going to be in the end. Like, you, you will be disassociated from if you do this and we'll have very stern words. Like, I, I don't know whether miners will listen to that, but it is an interesting battlefield that we're dealing with. So let's talk about some of the, the pushback that we've seen because there's been significant pushback. First of all, people have been calling this a tax and that's an interesting use of words because when you have a tax, you sort of think, well, it's forced, you have a gun to someone's head, there's no choice at all. Whereas if someone is saying, well, you do have a choice, but we're just going to orphan your blocks if you go up, if you don't do what we say. Yeah, I don't know how it's much like of a, I would agree with, I mean, to, the, to, some, to a very large degree, everything in this space is kind of voluntary, right? The government's not forcing any of us to participate in this, use these currencies or what have you. And I mean, to, to an extent, I mean, there's nothing stopping someone from just forking the protocol, um, you know, and without that change. Um, so uh, it, it's all of our participation is kind of voluntary. There's just a sense in which having that kind of fork or split kind of feels detrimental to the community. It kind of like breaks up a lot of the momentum that the coin has, and it's kind of like a nuclear option. So you, you kind of feel like, well, my only option here, if I don't want to go along with this, is I have to use the nuclear option, and that's not a great option either. So that's kind of why people might feel like it's a little bit of a tax. But the tax isn't even really on, if you want to call it that, it's not even on Bitcoin Cash users or even Bitcoin Cash miners. It's primarily falling on Bitcoin miners, BTC miners. Um, and then I guess the, the only downside for BCH, again, is that 12.5% reduction in the security. Level. Right. And I think that we have to also look at the last year and what the devs in Bitcoin Cash have been saying. Like this, I, I mean, a lot of people in cryptos, you guys know, they're voluntary. They're just dedicating their time. Some of them have full-time jobs elsewhere and they're part-time trying to do this. Other people have gone full-time and said, well, I'm just going to use the money that I've earned in crypto, put it back into the system and dedicate my time to supporting this. And so many of the de uh, developers are just putting this stuff out there as tools you know, for all of us to use because they want to make the world a better place. They want to give us options outside of, you know, Federal Reserve banknotes. And and it's, it's interesting, like, a lot of the backlash I've seen from the community has been very anti those devs, even though it's those people who've been putting in their, their time, you know, um, to make the, the network better. So there seems to be um, a mismatch in expectations in some degree of how much you can expect to, to profit from someone else's labor. There's sort of this expectation that devs will always be around and, and you know, we, we should just reap the rewards, but there's less talk about, well, how do we support these people who are building these awesome systems for us? So I think that the morale has gone down it's not just in bitcoin cash you see it across all areas of the crypto space about funding you know people who are creating great tools decentralized tools you know how do we support those people in the community so that we can keep these products around because it's not a given that these things are just going to stay around yeah i think there's there is a big i think misconception there a lot of this comes i think also from the bsv people i didn't mean to point at you when i said bsv people but uh um they they have a there's a view there where it's kind of there they they said and i've seen this said by a number of them like why do you, we need more development the software is already written like wh why do you why do you need developers can't we just continue using the same software unmodified basically forever and i i think that kind of there's a big misunderstanding of how software works there i mean software tends to like rot the longer it goes without people maintaining it there's there's libraries that get updated that require you to update your code. Um, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the, the programming language you use puts out new versions from time to time and you need to upgrade to that. Uh, there's bug fixes, refactoring, optimizations. There's a lot of work that needs to go on and especially in the Bitcoin code base, um, if, if, you know, with Bitcoin Cash, are, you know, we're kind of looking to scale um, you know, long term and allow more transaction volume. And you'd like, there's a lot of optimizations that we need to make in the software in order to support that. And you'd like to make those optimizations before you actually hit that level of transaction volume and you have a bottleneck, right? You'd rather remove the bottleneck in advance. Um, so there's actually a lot of work to be done. I think it's very, 
um, uninformed to kind of just say, well, the software's already ri written, why do we need more development? I think it's something like, I've seen numbers where it's like, I don't know, for every, um, uh, like, I don't know, like for every one, three li or for every line of code, it costs like three dollars in maintenance or something like that. Yeah, I've heard a number where it's like for every one dollar of writing code, you need eight dollars of maintaining the code. Yeah. So it's a very expensive, uh, in-depth process to keep things up to yeah, standard. Yeah, so it's not even necessarily just adding adding new features. People think keep saying like, well, how many new features do we need? It's not really, even if we added zero new features, it's just the ongoing kind of janitorial maintenance of the code base mm -hmm. uh, to a large extent. And also making sure that it's protected from hackers and people are finding bugs all the time. The yeah, original yeah. Bitcoin code was not bug free. There were a lot of things that needed to be fixed. Yeah. And you think about how many times you get a pop up on your computer or your phone saying, please update this software. It's, well, that's because they found a bunch of bugs and they're trying to patch them. And if you don't patch them, you have the huge security vulnerability in your device because you have people that immediately going to go and you know try to use that to get into your system so I mean crypto is no different they're constantly finding things that need to be changed they discovered a, a flaw in in Bitcoin after many many years that even with all the eyes looking at the code like combing through it meticulously no one had picked up and it was like an inflation bug right yeah, it, you yeah. know and that was just discovered uh, like last year or the year before yeah. so I think that th there's a big misconception about how much work this is to to do and um, um, a lot of taking people for granted, maybe, um, who are doing this work of their own volition. I mean, maybe as because we're running out of time here, maybe as we we wrap up, I want to talk about like how sustainable is a purely voluntary model? Because everyone seems to say, well, you know, you don't even need to solicit donations. Voluntary is fine. People can dedicate their time. That's enough. But how many really successful systems do we see in the open source world that are purely voluntary? There aren't many. It's I mean, open source is a new thing that people are trying out and the sustainability of a lot of these yeah. projects is still up in the air. Yeah, I, I really don't know. I mean, I was arguing with someone on, on this topic and he was like, listed out a number of software programs, open source, and he's like, well, they all run on donations. First one I looked at was GIMP, the, uh, the image uh, tool. And I looked at like one of the software developers, he had a, like a Patreon account and it was like, he was earning like less than poverty level wages. So I'm like, that's not a particularly good example. There. <laughs> yeah, and the idea of like, how do you incentivize good developers? Because again, yeah. you have to realize in Silicon Valley at the moment, you have people making, you know, 200, 400K a year. It's huge amounts of money. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a lot of the people who work on these like cryptocurrencies take a lot less money than they could make working in Silicon Valley uh, right off the bat just to kind of pursue their passion. There's like a discount there. Um, you know, many of these people are talented enough they could make $250,000 a year in Silicon Valley or something like that. Um, but don't, you know, they obviously take much less than that to work on, to work on these things. Um, I know I was talking to Ben, who is a Bitcoin Core developer, and uh, he gets money. He said he got some money, f gets some money from somewhere, but he basically said it was like poverty level wages. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's tough. How do you make this a sustainable thing? How do you incentivize good developers to your team? If you don't have a funding model, people are going to go to the, your competitors. You know, it yeah. is enough to say it's great to say, well, this is an important project. People should contribute their time, and people will contribute their time. But you can only ask people so much. If it comes to <laughs> accepting poverty <laughs> level <laughs> wages, there's a certain time where your savings run out, and it's just not feasible, and you yeah. have a family to feed, and you move on. And that's a reality that I think a lot of people in yeah, this space have. Yeah, I think you tend to see from even just the voluntary contributors. People come in, they're excited for a while, they last for six months, eight months, and then it kind of wears on them and then, then they're out. Um, so it's kind of you need that sort of funding to, to have a little bit more sustainable development. I also think you should point out, like, Bitcoin Cash is what, like number four, five on the mm -hmm. coin market cap list? And I mean, we're talking about funding here. Most of those coins, like much further down, certainly like out of the top 10 or 15, have like almost no development going on. Um, and so you have to question like why do they have any value at all um, when like very few people are working on them. Um, I think it was like, wasn't it like a few months ago there was like Litecoin, they said like Litecoin has like zero development going on right now. I don't know if that's changed, but I mean Litecoin's worth billions of dollars 
and no one's working on it. So, I mean, it doesn't give you a whole lot of confidence in it, but. It's, uh, it's definitely an interesting situation. So um, we'll be keeping you updated on everything that's going on with all of this and trying to find you know, sustainable models for supporting developers. As I said, I'm really excited that we at least have competition in the marketplace. We're trying out different systems. We're seeing maybe which coins will last. Maybe it comes down to maybe it's not the best tech, but maybe it's the coins that have built in funding models that will end up succeeding. I'm not sure. This is all an experiment. We'll have to see what, what happens there. But thank you so much, Chris. This has been, uh, been wonderful.